So back around 2000, I happened upon Nikki Wright, um, a kindred spirit who shared a love for all things ocean. That meeting sparked many adventures and much learning about our, our mutual love <clears throat> to see, and especially that little known or appreciated eelgrass. From this plant emerged the appreciation for all the creatures that depend on it for survival and sustenance. Bubble snails, nudibranchs, sheltering dungeness crabs, and abundant moon jellyfish, to name a few. The larval forage fish that were spawned on the beaches nearby shelter and grow in these eelgrass meadows, unknowingly providing sustenance for the salmon smolts that arrive on their way to the sea from the creeks upland and will gorge on this new seafood banquet. From these meadows, the salmon, particularly the Chinook, head to the open sea and to, to become, in turn, the very important main, food, main food source for the southern resident orca whales who depend on the salmon for their survival. And so the cycle goes on. I am so very pleased to introduce Nikki Bright, right, the executive director of Sea Change Marine Conservation Society. And uh, I'm so pleased to say that we've been fortunate to work and play together for many years. There you go. Thank you, Diane. It's a privilege to, uh, to do a presentation um, to this community. I've been working with Diane for many, many years and I know some of you, and I just really appreciate any time people show an interest in the ocean and in particular this, until not too long ago, unknown plant. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the Wasanic territory of the Coast Salish, and that includes the Sacum, uh, the Paquachin, the Sayout, and the Sartlet Bands of the Saanich Peninsula. It's been my great pleasure to live here for over 25 years and to work especially in the Saanich Inlet, which is very dear and near to the bands that live here for thousands of years. Um, I guess without much further ado, I'd like to start showing you pretty pictures because I learned a long time ago, if I don't show the pictures or hold the plant in my hand and pass it around, people don't, well, they didn't then, this was 2000, I guess. They didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> it's changed tremendously in the last 20, 21, 22 years. I'm really pleased to report, but back then I was talking to a group in Alert Bay, to a group of scientists. I was really nervous trying to um, talk about something that I was just learning about myself. I was really, really nervous. And I ended the, the talk and I thought, okay, I'm finally done. My knees were shaking. And afterwards the feedback was great presentation, but next time, could you show us a picture? And I thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> So let's go on to the pretty pictures. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to have to end so that I can go back. Holly, since you have control, could you also just push the volume button, or do I have to it's close this off? on your screen. I know, it's on you did not make it easy. <laughs> okay. If you just Sorry, that was a mistake. Go back, should be easy enough. Okay. It's just getting back. Well, you know what? It doesn't make that much difference because the sound is just going to be, um, oh, I'm having a hard time. Uh, it sound is just music, so I can just narrate the film when it comes up. So here we are, June 7th, Ocean's Day, um, one day of quite a few uh, event-filled days that um, the Sunshine Coast Conservation Association has been putting on. And again, I'd like to thank everyone, especially the organizers of these events. The whole story of eelgrass for me started uh, very close to the time that this nonprofit Sea Change Marine Conservation Society started in 1998. Um, we were doing a series of 
talks on the beach to a group of high school students, all part of a, um, an organization called LIFE, Leadership Initiative for Earth. And these high school students were coming across Canada to live during spring break on motor vessels and sailboats. And they would sail into the Salish Sea and learn about sustainable forestry, indigenous fisheries and how it was done, um, uh, forest, land and sea, ecology, restoration, all these wonderful things. And over time, we started to develop a longer and longer program trying to instill in these adventurous, intelligent youth about the uh, things that were going on with marine conservation at the time. And one of them was around national marine conservation areas. So we had a fun kind of time where we would give each person a role and tell them one person was a real estate agent, another person was a newspaper reporter, another person was a resident. And the beach that we were on was called North Cove on Thetis Island. So we would give them roles and give them a chance to get into the theater of the exercise. And the mission was to try to conserve this beach and the surrounding near shore into a conservation area. And they would go back to their boats and discuss it on their boats, sometimes late at night and come back. And that poor real estate agent was so frustrated. And the poor developer was so frustrated. These are kids 15, 16 years old. They started to understand that even though their own personal values were very pro-conservation, playing a role in a discussion, a round table discussion on how to conserve the marine environment was extremely difficult. So those were, that was just one example of some of the things that we were doing on the beach as we were uh, exploring the marine life intertidally and subtitally. One of the main organizers of this program that went on for five years was Trish Farrell. And she came from a Coast Salish community up near Deep Bay. And at the time, which was, uh, this was about 19, 99, 2000, she related that when she was a child of 10, she could watch the herring come in so thick that you could almost walk on them. She said it was shimmering pieces of glass coming in around March to lay their eggs on the plants that were in the deep bay. Um, herring will lay their eggs on anything, um, give them a creosote um, piling, or sargassum, which is a Japanese uh, invasive species of plant. But fortunately, back in her day, it was mostly eelgrass. And the herring would come and lay their row or their eggs on eelgrass. Well, First Nations were very ingenious and they would lay down hemlock boughs or cedar boughs uh, into the water. And as the herring lay their eggs, the branches and the boughs would be chock full of eggs. And then they would collect those boughs, put them in bins and store them for winter months. So Trish, who's 10 years old, watching the herring coming and laying in their, way, their, their row would, would water her mouth, just waiting to taste that row. So there they are sitting in the bins in her house. Her grandmother, who had eyes on the back of her head, was turned away from her and she would, run along the bin and swipe the blades of the boughs to try to get some row and stuff her mouth with this wonderful nutritious food. And grandmother without turning her head once said, and what are you doing? And Trisha's mouth was so full that she could hardly reply, but she said, nothing grandma. <laughs> and again, grandma did not turn her face. And she said, is it good? And, and Trish said, it's the best <laughs> with a mouthful of rope. That story, you could hear a, a pine needle drop in the forest nearby. The kids were just enchanted. And I'm listening maybe for the fourth or fifth time because those programs went on for four or five days straight. And I'm listening very carefully to her story and to the, to the tale of those herring coming into the bay. And I thought to myself, Sea change needs to give back to the ocean. We're always taking 
from um, the so-called sustainable yield that DFO was talking about all the time at fisheries conferences to even us being in the ocean collecting um, marine critters to show to school children on the beach in tide pools or our little swimming pools. Of course, we'd return those critters back to their habitat, but even while I was diving, collecting them, I always felt we're always taking, what can we return? So her tale of the, of the herring coming in and thinking about eelgrass, I thought to myself, I need to talk to people who know about eelgrass and where maybe it needs to be restored. And that was the beginning of a very long saga that we've been involved with for over 20 years, about how to bring back something into the ocean that we have a large part in damaging or destroying. So Trish, when she was talking about um, the row, and when I talk about eelgrass, or Diane is talking about the forage fish laying their eggs on the shore, or somebody else may be talking about kelp, it's all part of one system. We tend to educate ourselves in silos. So anytime I'm speaking about a particular value of a particular feature on a shoreline, Diana, myself, and many others try to make the connections for everyone about this is one living system that's all connected. Many of you know this already. So from the forest all the way to the depths of where the orca is, is diving, it all plays into each other in the nutrient cycle, in the food web cycle, um, it's all connected. As the fish feed the forest, the forest shades the forage fish that feed the orcas. It's just a complete and beautiful circle. First Nations are always talking about this. And I think it's high time that we finally incorporate it in our thinking so that in fact, restoration isn't as necessary as it is right now. So this is kind of a, um, a very wordy kind of graphic on what I mean by a living system. So if you start back in the, in the back shore, <clears throat> you have the trees filtering pollutants that might be coming from land activities further back. Uh, we're talking about maybe uh, pesticides or herbicides or oil coming from roads. Uh, that backshore vegetation, of course, provides habitats for all kinds of wildlife, uh, provides shade for forage fish. Even the logs on the shore provide habitat and stability on the shoreline. Uh, and then the oxygen and the carbon that's stored in eelgrass and the oxygen that's provided by its growth. Uh, also the plants uh, slow down erosion as does the kelp. And so it's all just one living circle. So even though I'm going to talk about eelgrass in particular, I just would request that you think about that as one part of a very complex and beautiful cycle. In First Nations uses and cultural uses, every part of the plant is used from the leaves for cooking insulation and housing insulation to the rhizome, which I'll talk about in a minute. The rhizome is that underground stem to which the roots are attached. That is used for ceremonies. Um, the Nichalnoth would dip the rhizome into ulican grease and use it for ceremonial food. The seeds were used for food and medicine and pottery sealant and the whole plant it's kind of a gathering site indicator because eelgrass likes to live in calm waters for the most part, though it does live in areas with high current. The majority of the native plant species that we'll be talking about tonight live in quiet bays and estuaries. What a great place to overwinter and um, withstand the storms as a community. It's just a picture of what I was talking about with the herring row. Uh, so heavily laden on the blades that um, probably those eelgrass blades are lying flat on the ground. That's just amazing. So eelgrass is seen as a nursery uh, for juvenile crabs and for 
areas for other species of fish uh, to lay their, their uh, eggs. Um, when Cynthia Durance, who I honor as the person who taught us everything we know about the plant, its ecology and restoration methods. When we went up to the central coast into Bella Bella, we were speaking to the guardians that watch over the waters there. And they were falling asleep because we were sitting inside under fluorescent lights and they were getting really bored. So I, um, I said to them, okay, it's not eelgrass we're gonna be talking about. It's where you collect your crabs. Where do you harvest your crabs? And they kind of woke up and said, oh, you mean the crab grass? Because that's where you'll find juvenile crabs. Every small, uh, many, 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 many species of fish and invertebrates um, find their sheltering spot in the shallow waters where eelgrass grows. I'm going to just have to break for a minute and close the door. I'm sorry. That's the puppy. <laughs> That's the puppy in the background. <laughs> yeah, eight month old puppies have their own needs. So can anybody guess where this picture was taken <laughs> in an eelgrass bed? Well, you can't talk to me because you're on mute. This is in Porpoise Bay. And uh, Seashelt Inlet is one of the richest areas for eelgrass productivity. Um, even though all that development is happening on land and many of the pollutants that affect the near shore water quality is happening increasingly in the community, I've never seen such healthy eelgrass as I do in Porpoise Bay. It's considered a salmon highway. And so I'm gonna discuss why that is. Um, in Washington state, they literally describe eelgrass as a highway. It serves that way because they, as I talked about before, they're nurseries for a young salmon, uh, either coming out of their natal streams, preparing themselves for the open ocean, getting the nutrients that they need to become robust. Um, and also for the adult salmon, going back to their natal streams and finding shelter from predators, waiting for the rains to come, provides food for 80% of commercially important fish um, and all kinds of species use it for some stage of their life cycle. And of course it's a refugia from predators and waves. So this is a wonderful graphic of just we're going to be talking about the plant tonight, but sometimes people refer to the life that grows on the blades of eelgrass as even more important than a meadow um, of plants. That the the microorganisms, both plant and invertebrate, that live um, and eat from the other animals on the blades is just as complex as as a meadow when you look at it generally. So the benthic, the, the, the animals that live on the surface of the seabed, the ones that live underneath it, all the microalgae, the small, small species of algae feed not only the animals feeding off of them on the blades, but as that food drops into the water column, it feeds all kinds of critters on the bottom itself. It's a very complex and wonderful, um, uh, environment. It's amazing when we're mapping eelgrass, and, and Diane will attest to this, we get rather solemn and kind of glum when we're in a, a muddy substrate, which is generally where this native eelgrass likes to grow, and it's not there. Or when I was diving, I'd feel very low. I would say, where is it? And then all of a sudden, there it was, you know, a bed would start to form and there we would be in a meadow and everybody just cheers up and starts talking. It's, it's almost as if we had seen an orca. It's that exciting. That's when you know that somebody's addicted. <laughs> all the signs are evident. And of course the food web goes all the way up to the largest animals, including the humpback whales feeding on forage fish. 
that uh, live part of their life cycle in eelgrass beds. This is an interesting chart of the native eelgrass that we're talking about, Sastera marina, um, in temperate zones. So the, the single black lines are the areas where this native species lives. Where the heavy lines are indicate where a slime mold wiped out many of the beds in the 1930s. And nobody really paid attention to this habitat until the clams started to disappear in Maine and other um, American states for the most part in the 30s on the, uh, north, on the Eastern seaboard and on that side of Europe as well, Western side of, of Europe. And then people started to realize, ah, the habitat is gone. Uh, the slime mold that was predominant uh, cause of the disappearance of eelgrass in the 30s is with us now. Um, it's always present in eelgrass beds, but it's only triggered to actually start destroying the beds when the ocean conditions make it conducive for it to take over. The sad part of that story is that warming sea surface temperatures are one of those conditions that can bring that slime mold on, just like with the sea stars and that slime mold that happened with the sea stars, with particular sea stars. Sunflowers, these are stars. So here's what the plant looks like. It's nice and healthy. And you can see that it changes color from white into a brown. That brown, as I said before, is an underground stem to which the roots attach. So the roots basically anchor the plant, but the food for the plant doesn't come as much from the roots as it is stored in the rhizome or that underground stem. It is the primary way that the plant reproduces itself. The other way it produces it reproduces itself is through seed, but it's kind of a magical process. The only place that I see a lot of seeding plants when I was a diver was in very crowded beds where there was no room in the seabed itself for the rhizomes to spread. And so I would see a lot of seeding plants the problem with this as a survival mechanism is those seeds actually pollinate on the surface of the water and then drop down magically to the right depth and substrate uh, in which it could reproduce itself. So it's not the most successful means of um, creating a meadow. There's two kinds of uh, Zostera on this coast. One is Japanese eelgrass. Zostera japonica. And then the other one is the Zostera marina. Um, and that one way to differentiate it is to look at the sheath, which is a transparent membrane that holds the blades together. When you separate two blades, as on the top part, that's Cynthia's fingers, <laughs> she's separating two blades apart, and she will notice that the sheath is not intact, but it actually just folds over. It's an overlapping sheath. So there's no tearing involved. On the bottom, when you try to separate those two blades, you'll feel this ripping effect because the sheath is actually intact and you're ripping the membrane. I'm going to go back to that picture just for a moment and just talk just for half a second. One of the problems with restoration in the early days, the 80s and the 90s primarily, was that <clears throat> eelgrass restoration did not work because it was not understood that there's kind of three uh, subtypes of the native species according to the depth at which it grows. So the native and the Japanese eelgrass look very similar because they're rather short. They're kind of like the length of your grass if you let it uh, grow too long. They're thin bladed and they're about the same height, the two species and the two subspecies. As you go down into the subtitle area, the plant gets a little taller and then it goes into the depths of up to mm, probably seven to eight meters, you'll have the tallest plant. 
So each of those types of plants are called ecotypes. And when restoration was first beginning, it wasn't understood that you couldn't really mix the ecotypes. You can't take a native eelgrass ecotype from the shallow area and plant it in the mid zone or the deeper zone and expect success because the morphology or the characteristics of that plant are adapted to the depth at which they grow, which is basically how they're reaching for the light. So once the ecotypes were understood, there's no mixing or matching. Restoration is about making sure that the conditions and the depth range of where the plants came from, from the donor site, are the same that are being used for the restoration site itself. This is a, a fun part of, uh, of this presentation because I'm showing you a local hero, Dave um, Sanford and his partner, Diane. And this is an excellent way of showing that kayakers can be a part of this story of recovery of eelgrass uh, beds. We tend to monitor after we do a restoration every six months for about five years if resources are available. What we're thinking about is making more robust a volunteer program where volunteers can come in on their kayaks and just take a peek and maybe some pictures in between those six month intervals to see how that eelgrass is doing. Because without the eyes and ears of the local community, things can happen, as you know, on the surface of the water that can really damage eelgrass. And we come along twice a year and don't know the story. The Diane and Dave and the volunteers that they've recruited over all the years, they can tell us that a barge came in and stayed there for two months or that um, so a whole lot of boat anchoring happened at this particular spot. So when we come in to anchor, or sorry, to monitor, and we notice these changes in densities, people can explain to us why that happened. Just gonna briefly show you some beautiful maps that Diane and Dave have done over the years. Um, the different colors indicate the dates that those maps were made. So they did incredibly detailed um, work on looking at eelgrass beds and describing their characteristics. And these maps can be used for better improved land use decisions, as well as paying attention to what's going on with boat activities. And Gibson's Harbor was mapped also in 2019 by Fiona and Diane. And that those maps are being actively used in the harbor to do some planning. So when development is planned, we know what happened before and after. If we don't have a baseline, even if it's based in 2019 or 2017, uh, and then development happens on the land and some bad things happen to that eelgrass, we can actually explain what it used to look like. But my, my idea of a baseline is basically the cultural practices of indigenous peoples. That's the original baseline. So anytime it's possible to talk to elders or to the community at large of a local First Nations, where they harvested their clams or did their crabbing, um, then that is where I would consider knowing where the eelgrass beds were. And they can oftentimes describe how lush they were. With climate change, we have a few options. One is relinquishment, one is building resiliency, and one is restoration. The ultimate one in my mind is conservation, saving what we have left and making sure it's protected. This picture is a picture of um, sea level rise risk of shorelines. Um, the red is the most vulnerable. So this means as sea level rises, those red zones and most estuaries are red zones. That's where the most impact on the shore is gonna be felt with sea level rise. And the green is most, um, or is less vulnerable. Why did I show this? Because we're all know living on the coast that we're going through a lot of changes. It's already happening. And so where can we think about relinquishment? What does that mean? 
It means that many of our populations, majority of the populations of the world live close to the ocean. And many of us, even locally, don't understand that the ocean wins every time. Even if we build walls or try to build uh, any kind of barrier, including putting sand on the beach, they're all temporary solutions. The ocean is going to win every time. So what I mean by relinquishment is there are a few communities in the world who are thinking ahead. I think Amsterdam and Holland in general is thinking this way of relinquishing our settlements near the coast and moving backwards. If we were wise, we'd start to really seriously think that. This is what's happening now in, in local communities. I know that you as a community have felt the impacts of winter storms and you are watching all the time uh, the slow rise of sea level. So relinquishment is considering the expensive task of settling back, moving our properties back and letting the ocean do what it's going to do. Sometimes, oftentimes, I will say, in many of our experiences, people buy properties and want that sea view, right? So they cut down those forests and those native plants and build walls or use riprap to uh, slow down erosion. And there's so much wrong with this picture, <laughs> it's so much wrong. And we do this in little increments, but they, um, they measure up to huge impacts and we do it all the time. So kelp and eelgrass slow down wave action. So the more that we can conserve these important habitats, the slower the wave action towards the ocean, towards the, um, the shore. I'm showing you this picture because of that rhizomatic mat that forms in dense eelgrass beds actually settles the sediment and makes it more stable. One of the other impacts besides the big one of climate change is boat anchoring. This, is, this picture was taken in uh, Australia and it shows the circular desert that's formed when boats rotate on their anchors because of tides and currents and basically are um, fragmenting an otherwise continuous bed of seagrass. And this is basically what happens under the water. Anchor chains um, scour the seabed and as the tides come and go and currents uh, pass by a boat over time, there's a little desert that nothing, where nothing can live, a little radius underneath that boat. There's a solution and it's not an expensive one called a midline buoy system. And uh, we see changes installed so far four in Ford Cove on Hornby Island and one off in um, Manion Bay off of Bowen Island. And basically it does away with the anchor chain and uh, suspends the anchor into the midwater zone. They're not hard to install. They're very seaworthy. And if one has to, or has already <clears throat> situated themselves permanently in an eelgrass bed, the eelgrass will recover underneath the boat because the boat is not stable. It will rotate and not cause a permanent shading. And that anchor chain is no longer making a desert of the seabed. Another way of conserving eelgrass is by um, doing voluntary no anchor zones. This picture was taken in Port Townsend in Washington and it has very successfully protected a very dense continuous bed right in front of the town. And most people now are very cognizant of that uh, decal. So we're repeating that signage uh, in two places right now, one in Manion Bay uh, with the help of the Bowen Island municipality and one in Cowichan Estuary with the cooperation and agreement with the Cowichan tribes. Log booms are a long lasting uh, damaging effect on eelgrass beds. Um, this is a side scan sonar picture of what log booms look like under the substrate. 
what happens basically is that the debris, the wood that's lying on those logs, the longer they sit in the water, the wood debris from the logs drift down into the seabed and basically change the life under that, um, under those logs biologically, chemically, and physically. The longer the log boom is there, the longer the impacts uh, exist. So that's where my partner, Sarah, and a dive team have been restoring your grass for over 20 years in places oftentimes impacted by log booming activity. So I'm going to show you uh, what an eelgrass bed looks like when it's newly planted. And we've done this in several sites, at least six, if not seven sites in Seashelt Inlet. And this is kind of a neat uh, short video. You may not hear the sound, but that's okay, I'll narrate. Can you hear that? Can you hear the music? You can, okay, then I'll be quiet. <laughs> This site is just uh, an estuary off the Cowichan estuary. It doesn't actually seem like we can hear the audio, Nikki. So if you want to narrate over it. Sure, I'd love to. Okay, so this was a former uh, logging mill and a lot of debris comes into this little bay, houseboats, um, uh, all kinds of floats, styrofoam, garbage on the surface of the water. And then shortly you'll see the debris that's under the water. We did a big cleanup in this area in 2017. This is where the hopeful music comes in. <laughs> so there's a shift in the music. <laughs> ah, the heroes and heroines <laughs> arrive on the scene. This is community members in the Cowichan Valley. They've been involved in eelgrass restoration for, oh, I don't know, 16, 17 years now. It's one of my um, poster child communities. So this part of the video is just going to very quickly give you a summary of how we do our transplants. This donor site is in the territory of the Cowichan tribes. And we asked if we could um, uh, harvest the plants uh, with their blessing. Harvesting happens with a light touch. In other words, we, we swim constantly. We never try to harvest from one particular plot so that any one area is left bare. The eelgrass will recover itself within six months, according to Cynthia. And we've seen that to be true because we sometimes in lush beds like Porpoise Bay, we can harvest from one site uh, maybe twice a year. So those harvested donor plants are put into a goodie bag. We lay down a transect in our restoration site, which is a long line. And very sophisticated, 
very sophisticated equipment like laundry baskets, hold the young grass that the community members uh, have prepared for planting. The transect is used so that we can have a design to monitor. If we just uh, put them kind of haphazardly into the seabed and we came back six months later, we wouldn't know what kind of changes were going on, whether the plants are growing together and becoming a bed or they're becoming fragmented uh, because of maybe boat anchoring or uh, an abundance of juvenile crabs that come in or whatever. Oftentimes these former log booming sites have very, very unconsolidated sediment. That means that when Jamie is going to dig into the seabed, you're gonna find how much sediment rises. So sometimes it's difficult. You have to have a method to your madness when you're planting. We group these plants in groups of 10. There we go, you see how much sediment. It's so unconsolidated. There's no plants to solidify that sediment until that eelgrass comes along. We plant in groups of 10, approximately a meter apart, so that we have a definite design. We come back and look at that design over and over again. How is it changing? Is it filling in? That's what it looked like six months later. Poor visibility, but you can see that the the shoots are spreading. That site I would consider a success. Uh, we planted there several times and it's doing very well. So when we monitor, as I said before, we monitor every six months after the transplant for five years. Um, that small device on the lower left is called a hobo and it monitors the light that's coming down into the eelgrass as well as the water temperature. We look at shoot density as a major indicator whether a bed is restoring itself or not. We've also do a lot of uh, debris removal. This is a fish net that was in Porpoise Bay, left over from um, a prior industrial activity. Um, fish nets are incredibly damaging, not only the seabed, but everything that lives on, under, or on top. So it was a real relief to finally get all of that removed. It's very time consuming and rather dangerous work. The signage um, is really, I think, one of the ways to educate people and also it gives me hope that our conservation actions such as the no voluntary zones, the midline buoy system and the signage is really the secret to increasing conservation protection of these beds. Restoration is a good way to bring people together to work towards a common cause, to give hope, um, but the dent that we're making, I'll be very honest, is very minuscule. Restoration is a hopeful activity at the time, but if we don't stop doing all these activities out of ignorance, the restoration can go on forever and we won't be making the difference. We'll actually continue to suffer a net loss of really critical marine habitat. We put these uh, resources in the chat box because it's hard to write down something very quickly, but these are three sources of information if you want to find out more about what's going on um, with mapping, with monitoring, uh, and with volunteer events. Um, 
then look at these three sites. They're, they'll tell you what's going on in the Salish Sea. I want to thank the audience, the organizers, the First Nations that make us, uh, uh, give us the, the livelihoods and uh, the enjoyment of living here. And these people here who offered their advice or their uh, photographs and images. And now I'm ready for any questions or comments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Nikki. That was wonderful. I learned a whole lot. I absolutely love eelgrass and have very fond memories of diving through eelgrass meadows and just being like, oh, like it's, there's so much stuff that lives there. It's, it's incredible. So thank you. The imagery definitely helps to, to portray the message that you're sharing. So appreciated that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, as Nikki said, we can open things up for questions now. If people would like to put them in the chat box, we can um, definitely answer them, them there. And I think Diane might do some of the, the reading of questions if people would like to throw their comments in there. Um, alternatively, if you don't want to type, you could also unmute yourself, just trying to make sure that we're not unmuting multiple people at the same time so we can hear what you'd like to say. I see James Mack, maybe you've unmuted. Would you like to start off the questions? Sure, sure. So I have uh, a Land and Marine Conservation Society uh, here on Texada Island. And uh, one of our bays that I'm looking out the window at at the moment um, has a perfect substrate <clears throat> for eelgrass. And the northern bay, which is called Maple Bay, has a beautiful eelgrass bed in it. Many times eelgrass ends up on the beach here. And I have noticed that it's, it's not, um, so to speak, uh, taken the, what I would consider a perfect substrate and actually you know, reintroduced itself, uh, which is interesting. And I haven't really studied it further. But one of my other questions is when all the mapping was done by Islands Trust, Texada is not in the Islands Trust. And then there was a general mapping. And of course, our bay here to the north is not on any map. So the question might be, uh, Nikki, or anyone that might know, um, how can I get this eelgrass site on the map showing that it's here? It's already in a conservation area, but of course, we're doing marine conservation and proposing a marine protected area along this coast would be very helpful for us to map that one and a few others that I have seen down the coast uh, uh, in, in our conservation zone. So um, question, uh, answer there on, on how to get ourselves on that map. Yeah, it wouldn't be the Islands Trust map. You, James, are, are part of a nonprofit, right? Yes. Are you, are you um, a society? Are you a- Society. Could you contact me? Sure. <laughs> the reason I'm, I'm asking that, I'll be really honest. We had a really good time mapping all the 13 islands uh, for the Islands Trust a few years ago. They just put out a bid um, to have it done again. And we decided not to do it this year because our capacity is lower. Um, and you just got me all excited <laughs> because I really miss um, the ability to go out and do eelgrass mapping and we're not going to be doing it for Islands Trust this year. It'll be some other company or whatever. And I would love to get your eelgrass and other islands that are not in Islands Trust, especially since you're working towards a conservation area, that's all the more reason yeah. to validate the status of conservation by saying, this is what's here to protect. Yeah. So if you could, if you could contact me Let's brainstorm about funding to get that happening. I'm not trying to say sea change could do it or, or you know, waving our flag, but I'm saying that what you're suggesting is incredibly important and we could help you look at what kind of funding sources could be available to you. And then if sea change has the ability to do it, we'd love to do it yeah. with you. Well, I, I think a partnership would be perfect. And it's I, very exciting what you just brought up. You just lifted my spirits. <laughs> and, and we, Thank you. We have our own funding also, so we can participate in the funding ourselves. Let's talk. 
We have the boats this with all the things necessary to get in the water. So, um, yeah, this would be great. So that's okay. the answer. I'll talk to you and I'll find out the answers along those lines. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Go from there. All right. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, do oyster farms affect eelgrass growth? Is there a, um, there's a combe filmed with oyster farms, but little eelgrass that we're familiar with. This is from Derry Brown. Did we, did we talk about that one yet? No? Okay. All right, so I can't give you any scientific evidence that oyster farms um, create damage for beds, but I will say that as any plant needs light and when water quality is impacted by industrial scale activities of any kind on the ocean, I think we have a problem, <laughs> Houston. Um, so we're talking about aquaculture in general, talking about any industrial scale activity that includes fuel floating on the water or on the seabed, um, things that are used to feed a fish that are not indigenous to this province. Um, when we get to the industrial scale, we're causing problems for surrounding habitats. Even if the oyster farm is further away in deeper water, it could have damaging effects on the near shore. And we do know that islands such as um, Demon Island is facing these problems all the time mm -hmm. because that's industrial scale. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thanks, Nikki. Yeah. Um, this may be a bit of a repeat. Um, can we find some way to register known beds and depths of eelgrass on marine charts for local waters? This yeah. is from Leanne. Especially digital navigation maps should make it easy for known beds. You'd think it was an easy process. We tried. Do you remember the history of that, Diane, and what the final answer has been so far? <sighs> Well, let's see. We've this. tried. <laughs> we tried to get it on the digital maps that uh, mm -hmm. people use on their boats, and mm -hmm. we're told no. And I can't remember the answer. That's my problem. Um, it seems to me we tried uh, to have um, at least presence of eelgrass in the Navionics system. That's exactly right. Yeah. And um, there were issues with that and I'm trying to remember what the issues were um, and it, it was just basically a, a, a no we were given a no answer to that request um, I think there was something about there are numerous systems not just Navionics for one um, and um, so uh, you could not provide something for one uh, server and not others um, and uh, if my husband was here, I, he could probably give you, you a real earful on, on what happened there because he's really been pushing for that uh, for, for years. years. Yeah. And it yeah. makes the most sense because I think if voters knew, <laughs> some of our um, education would already just be there on the map. Yeah. Yeah. Very good question. And I really appreciate that, that, that question. Okay. Uh, uh, cool. Let's see what else have we got. No, uh, oh, let's see. Just checking out here. Sarama, did you have a question for us? I don't want to put you on the spot here, but I don't see the question, but I thought you had one. Yeah, he was asking about the Nanaimo River estuary. Looks like it's uh, fairly heavily impacted by industry, and he's wondering if there's anything happening there to restore that ecosystem. I know the Pacific Salmon Foundation is very interested in that site. Um, the Sanaimu First Nations would love to have eelgrass back in their waters. Um, and my feeling from personal experience and doing a little bit of transplanting with Cynthia Durant is that the log leases have to be um, reduced um, quite a bit before there's any chance of recovery. It's been um, industrial scale, once again, 
a log storage there for so many years that recovery of that estuary is, is going to take a very, very long time and a retirement of leases. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, Diane, when I was working on the film, I was over in Nanaimo and um, I was really struck by the, how beautiful the Nanaimo River estuary was and also the impact that it had suffered from industry. And it struck me that the potential there for uh, just to like, if that ecosystem was able to be recovered, it would, it would be in, incredible. Mm -hmm. It just, I thought it was just had amazing potential. And it was sort of what struck me is that it seemed sort of destroyed. And yet I could see how rich it must have been at one time. Mm -hmm. A huge estuary, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge and yeah, and very productive in its day. But I think yeah. also highly industrially impacted for a long period of time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. So, yeah. Mm. Um, so shall we go to another question? It, um, Patty is saying that she loves the alternative option for anchoring. Um, now that they're uh, beginning the licensing of boaters um, more, could this information be distributed to boaters? Yeah, and if anybody has good ideas about how to get these conservation actions more out there, because I have been talking to boaters, but I'm only one person. And um, if we could collectively talk to other boaters um, as peers, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes in my experience again, that if I'm not a boater, which I'm not, um, if I come in and do a talk to a yacht association, they oftentimes see me as trying to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that peer education is the most powerful and if anybody has any ideas about how to get the word out more effectively, these solutions are not expensive. Um, the no anchor zones, the uh, midline buoys, the, the signage, they're not expensive. They just need to get out into the broader, you know, what happened in Puget Sound could happen here. Um, it is happening. One of the things that happened that sparked all the change so that they're 20 years at least ahead of us in some of their conservation activities is that their population is much higher than ours. So their impacts were felt a lot sooner, but we are starting to feel the impacts, especially since COVID came, many, many people wanna escape onto their boats and the bays and estuaries that were experiencing a mild amount of Anchorages are not chock full. Yeah. Um, and so we can learn from them about how to normalize certain kinds of behavior. Um, if we frown upon people letting out their brown water, for example, it's just like jaywalking. You know, in Victoria, hardly anybody jaywalks because people are frowned upon. And mm -hmm. opinion means a lot. Nobody does not strap themselves into a seatbelt anymore, right? Everybody automatically reaches for their seatbelt. It's just common part of our culture. But that's what we're trying to do with attitudes about the ocean is just make it normal. <laughs> it's not somebody coming from the outside telling somebody else what to do. It's just, this is the proper way to being a boater. End of story, right? right. And so we're getting some recognition through the decals for example, on the voluntary no anchor signs, they're both going to be the same. So that people coming from Olympia, Washington into Seashelt will see the same sign and say, oh, I know what that means. Yes. It's like a stop sign when you're a driver. Mm -hmm. So that will help normalize things. Mm -hmm. um, Leanne, it's so nice to see your nodding head. I hate seeing because I can't, I can't um, see your faces. <laughs> So thank you for that enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we can normalize this behavior and change our attitudes, then problem is solved. We could conserve and stop restoring because restoration, again, is awfully expensive 
and it can never make the wrongs right 100%. We cannot be mother nature. We try to mimic her, but the damage is damage. And we try to bring back and we can succeed to a certain extent, Mm -hmm. but restoration more than ever, is just an anchor point for people to come together and talk about how to conserve. (laughs) Part of it is education, part of it is education, a part of it is education. (laughs) There we go. (laughs) <laughs> an interesting addendum to this uh, question and it just saying consistent signage is a great idea mm-hmm. i wonder about qu- uh, power squadron courses boarding boarding courses sharing this perhaps um my thought on this is with the addition of more licensing happening why can't we convince the government that's issuing that licensing to have something in there saying yes. this is what we need to do on the big scale, the huge scale, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Proper ways of being on the water. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, Terry has a question. Um, where was the location of the humpback whale feeding on sandlands? We're interested to know if they feed on sandlands in the Salish Sea. I don't, I can't confirm that that was sandlands. Maybe Diane can. It sure I don't know where that picture was taken. I'm okay. sorry. It sure looked like Sandlands to me. All yeah, the, yeah definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Leanne, you have your hand up. Yeah, I uh, I had another um, in relation to uh, the boater thing. Um, there are s- well. First of all, I am just shocked at what's happening to Desolation Sound, which is far from desolate. In fact, it's becoming desolate of all living creatures because of the excessive number of idiots up there in boats. And yet there are an awful lot of really well-intentioned people, in addition to the idiots, who I think simply don't know Mm-hmm. And I'm sort of thinking if there's some way of including information with uh, boater tourism things or their publications, the, uh, the, some of the, like Refuge Cove would be a perfect place to have some kind of display. And it fits right in with the values of, of the people who operate the commercial stuff there. And, there are a lot of little commercial uh, places up uh, in the islands and further north that I think could be quite sympathetic and a lot of boaters, <coughs> if there's just some way of getting information to them. I, I'm not sure if anybody else has ideas about how that might be done, but yeah. Yeah. Diane, James has his hand up. Uh, James, sorry. Yeah. No problem. So uh, along these lines, um, our, our society uh, funded the signs along the Sailor Sea, which are about the whales, which is the sign that says, if you see a blow, go slow. Yeah. We've seen those. Mm-hmm. So we purchased those. Originally, I was from the States almost 20 years ago and had a sign making company there that can do them at... Uh, you know, 25% of the cost, very economical metal, aluminum signs, full four color signs. So we ordered those and I had them brought up and picked them up at the border. And then they got distributed all over the area by volunteers. The thing that I like a lot is the buoy sign that you showed in your presentation. But a buoy sign is relatively expensive to anchor and to put there. But a sign that would be on the shoreline could be multiples in different on both sides of a small bay or like in Jedediah, if there's a spot, you could put them on both sides. Mm -hmm. And these these might say voluntary, no anchoring zone, eelgrass bed, uh, 50, you know, 20 meters, 50 meters, whatever. At least if they didn't read their 
their license, if they didn't read the book, if they don't care, they can't miss those signs. Now, we ordered, I think, 50 to begin with, and we could have ordered 150 or 250 of these signs. So the signage um, also can be supported by the, by the provincial government and DFO or whoever to sign on to it uh, to help pay for them. Uh, in this case, we were able to fund the first 50 signs just out of our own society. So I would think that some signage along those lines that's physically right in front of them, they pull into a bay, maybe they're not even from here, right? They're boating up the coast, they'll see the sign. And if it means anything to them, they might consider to anchor somewhere else or to use an anchoring system that won't be damaging uh, potentially. Um, the permanent moorings uh, actually are beneficial, of course, because then perhaps it has the style that you're talking about on it. So I think all of those things on an educational basis will certainly help in concert with one another. But the idea of having a permanent sign that's attached to a tree or somewhere right on the shoreline where they're anchoring, even if they don't decide to do it that time, if they see it in every eel gas bed, you know, in the Salish Sea someday, people start to respect it to a certain degree, just like signage on the street when you're driving a vehicle. So just a suggestion of what might be possible uh, in terms of signage. Right, right. Hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, an interesting, an interesting thought. It's not always easy, unfortunately. That's I've been, been working in the, in the inlet, trying to get some, some uh, signage going, but we'll see. Um, Sarama, you have a regarding brown water. We're installing a marine composting toilet on the boat we're building. Well, that sounds like a very cool idea. Um, and you mentioned articles in yachting magazines. I have a story for you here. Oh, and being mindful of time. My apologies, we are running over time. Uh, we will not be offended if you have to leave us, <laughs> um, but we're just in a good, good scan of, of discussion. And here we've just got to carry on a little bit more. Uh, I um, was reading a, I think it was, um, oh, I want to say it was a yachting magazine and they were discussing anchoring and they were discussing um, types of anchors and all of this. And I kept reading and reading as I read on, I was became more and more horrified because I was reading about this anchoring and depths and you know, uh, safe anchoring and da, 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 da. And there was not a mention of eelgrass, not a peep. I think this was Pacific Yachting Magazine, actually. Mm -hmm. I was horrified. Um, I was mortified and I got so irate about it. I wrote an article just for their letters to the editor or whatever. Um, and just said, you know, what have you forgotten here? You've forgotten one of the most important things. It produces all of this living, breathing life out there for the oceans. Um, the eelgrass, which incorrect mooring um, will destroy. Um, and I did get a, a note back from them. I actually had an email back from them because I, I gave my information as well. Um, and they basically said, oh, we just didn't even think about it. <laughs> and so, you know, when you speak signage, um, you know, it's very true. You know, awareness is, is a huge, huge issue. Um, but then... We don't want to have to plaster signs everywhere either, um, just because of the impact of them and themselves, um, you know, can be an issue. I don't know. I'm, I'm in a dilemma mode for that. Okay, Patty, you have a, a comment here. COVID sure encouraged people to get outside. It's good that people are starting to become more connected with nature, which is very positive. But yes, with many people that are not aware enough but how to act in the natural world uh, can cause, sure cause issues. Also the sheer number of people out in boats can be problematic. I like the expansion of signage. And I think asking government to share a bunch of this, slow for whales, regulations about the distance to stay away and no anchoring to preserve eelgrass and more. And absolutely, I mean, if they are paid by us, why can't they do stuff to um, improve our, our oceans and uh, minimize our impacts that we're often doing without even knowing it. And Saram is saying to, to add to that is why, what about signage in yacht clubs and marinas? Well, you'll see our, little, our, our sign at the end of the public dock in, in uh, Porpoise Bay. That's where that sign is located. 
And I know that Fiona, who's doing working house hound, uh, I think is, is um, working on signage that will go up in the Gibsons Marina sometime this year. So there's a couple. And um, it becomes more complex. In Seashelter Inlet, um, there are very many sensitive areas um, that the Seashelter Nation, um, what would I say? They don't want disturbance and they, and they don't want to draw attention um, to. And so there's a bit of a, uh, what, a balance, I guess a balance of, of uh, what signage can be or where it can be located, I suppose, is, is, a, is a better um, way to put it. So you really have to be sensitive to that as well. And I think, unless I've missed a question, Holly, I think we're we're just about there. Oh, maybe one more. Um, <laughs> Leanne, there she is. It's not in there, sneaky. Leanne. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. Carbon sequestra sequestration as part of deacidification de is not well known. Any more data on that function? So with eelgrass, um, it's becoming academically well known that the value of carbon sequestration by our native eelgrass in this area of the world is not as efficient as that of tropical areas. Mm. One of the difficulties is that eelgrass sloughs its blades at least seven times a year. So there's a lot of biomass, <clears throat> a lot of uh, eelgrass tissue that ends up on the shore as well as in depths of water. And a lot of that stores carbon. So there's no way of measuring um, the total amount of carbon that's stored by eelgrass in this part of the world when a lot of it, a large percentage of it over the year is buried at depth. Um, so it's a complex question because I think the whole issue of blue carbon, uh, it, for me, is a difficult one uh, because of all kinds of uh, game playing that's happened with the carbon credits, which happened a few years ago. So I've become a little soured about the whole issue of blue carbon. I think that we should just think about the multi the multi, uh, multiple complex functions that kelp and eelgrass and other seaweeds play and fold it all into that conversation about ecosystem services, somewhat for humans and a large part for just all, all life. And blue carbon is part of it, but it's not, it's the flavor of the day with the federal and provincial government. And I have a resistance to it to make it the only reason why we do conservation for eelgrass beds. It's part of the problem or part of the part of the um, the picture. But as I said before, it's very difficult to measure the actual metrics of how much carbon is being stored by this habitat. So let's just fold it in to everything else that it offers and say, yes, it does sequester carbon and it does provides oxygen and it does this and it does that and just keep that conversation going and not use that silo thinking that I started my talk on. Let's not continue that line of thought because it doesn't, it doesn't incorporate the complexity and the beauty of what we've got here. That's so important to conserve. Mm -hmm. I'll get off my soapbox. I so appreciate uh, being able to present to you and it's a real pleasure to see your faces. And I'm looking forward to, to talking to Anybody who wants to contact me, um, it'd be lovely to continue the conversations and the ideas for future actions. So. Absolutely. Thank Hi, you. Chika. Thank you. Hi, Chika. Yes, our hands go up to you. I really appreciate you taking the time to present. I feel super inspired. Lots of work needed to be done, but, but presenters like you leave us with hope and that's really amazing. So thank you for being our thank final you. webinar presenter of, of our webinar series that we're hosting. We are very, very grateful to you, Nikki. And, thank you. Um, 
I just put in some links in the in the chat throughout the meeting here if you wanted to contact Nikki, if you wanted to find her website and more information on some of the, the projects that she was talking about. There's links throughout the chat box there if you'd like to go check out those. Mm -hmm. um, I've also put links to the SCCA's um, page, our donation page, and the Green Film Series page if you'd like to show some support to both of our organizations. Um, we've been able to offer these webinars and the films for free and we're happy to do so because this knowledge is, is important for all of us to, to hear and to enjoy. Um, and if you're able to support us, that would be wonderful and greatly appreciated. Uh, and on the note of films, um, the webinars and the film registrations are, are separate. Hopefully everyone here has been able to, to watch the films of our film festival. If you haven't, there's tonight and all of tomorrow, not too much time left, but a little bit. Um, and so I've put that registration link there for anyone who wants to, to go and take a last look. And there's a couple right. films I wanted to just highlight for you that really connect to what we were talking about this evening. Um, one of them is, is a feature film that's actually made by uh, a, a audience member here. Sarama has done some amazing underwater filming um, in the Salish Sea. So I wanted to highlight this living Salish Sea as one of our feature films, um, as well as some short films directed by the Hakai Institute and Sea Change that are all about eelgrass. So some follow up information for you there if you'd like. Um, and, and last but not least, I'll say, you know, this is our final webinar that we are hosting, but tomorrow being Oceans Day, we couldn't leave that day blank. So we're, we're kind of um, supporting, in a sense, the, an, another webinar that's being hosted by the Howe Sound um, Biosphere Region Initiative, and they will be uh, focusing all on glass sponge reefs, which are amazing ecosystems as well in their own right. So hopefully if you've gotten a link for tonight's webinar, you'll sh you should also be getting a link tomorrow morning for the webinar in the evening. And until then, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your Monday evening. Hopefully you've got a little bit of sunshine today and you can relax this evening with a full brain, full heart. So thank you everyone and, and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Billy. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs>